in 2012, there is no doubt that the internet is the, the center stage of our lives, whether it's economically, politically, socially. And you need a copyright system that fits that era, basically. And, and the honest truth is that the copyright system isn't working at the moment for all of those needs. It doesn't get the income to the artists that we want. Often people don't know where they can find legal information or they don't feel that they have it at a, a, a fair price. And it's complicated for the people who want to invest in all of that content. So, you know, we believe that the copyright system has to work a lot better than it is at the moment. We will never say piracy is okay. It's not. It's not okay to 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 take things that that are uh, are not yours or to not make a contribution to the cost of creating them. But it's not necessarily the main problem either. You know, the main problem is that we don't have enough legal content because I think most people would want to do the the right thing and make a contribution if they could. And then there's a lot of people as well who want to give their works away through a Creative Commons license or through some other form of, of sharing. And they, sh they should have the right to do that. It shouldn't just be about making money. It's also about our intellectual and spiritual well-being. And so there should be ways for people to share that content, basically. Um, but we want to try and make a distinction between sites like a mega upload is a famous example. You know, we can't talk specifically about one court case, but you would have to say that there was some questionable practices involved there and that's really different from one person sharing some photos or copying something out of google images or something like that you know i don't think targeting those sorts of users is is the way to deal with with, with the problem what we've got to do is try and be proportionate and to try and make sure there's as much legal content as as possible available it's as friendly as, as we, can, we can make it. I think sometimes um, it's, it, it's easy to make a complaint, but it's much harder to come up with a way to reform a system, for example. So, um, you know, La Quadrature de Net um, have some very, very strong views on net neutrality, for example, which is slightly different to the copyright issue. But it's really interesting. They want us to uh, really uh, come in with a heavy-handed legal approach and to defend net neutrality and they want us to do that before we've gathered all of the evidence about what is really happening on the ground and so it's 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 a bit strange in a way you know they they say that based only on the information that the telecoms companies have provided that that's enough for us to step in and to regulate with a really heavy hand but you know we're saying we want to listen to users first and we we have a project where we're researching exactly how fast people's internet is in their home um, it can tell us whether things like skype are being blocked by their internet provider and we want to get all of that information before we make um, decisions so so for us it's surprising sometimes when the the ngos say okay um, act now before you've heard from the individuals and then on, whereas in net neutrality, they want very heavy action. On copyright, they want us to stop interfering. They don't want any, or, or they want much fewer rules about copyright. So sometimes they're very different competing perspectives. And what we always try and do is keep a, a balance and, and make sure we've heard from everybody. And that doesn't please all of those different lobby groups. We don't even have an exact definition of net neutrality even. You ask 10 people and they will give you five or six different definitions of, of net neutrality. So what we've said as an absolute minimum is that we want an open internet in the sense everyone has the right to access a basic internet. There should be no problems with that. But potentially it's not a very open approach if we start saying you can only offer one type of internet or that even if you only want to do these certain things in the internet actually you have to pay for all of it and you have to pay a higher price um, to make sure everyone can have access to a full internet. Something that is very worrying is if people can't use basic services like Skype. So for example one uh, telecoms company they might say we block Skype because Skype is a threat to us because then people will use their mobiles less if they use Skype on their internet package. And in our view, that's not really acceptable behavior. You know, that's part of competition, that's part of innovation. It's really good for consumers. Those options exist already, for example. The Creative Commons system is something that uh, Nelly Cruz uses all the time. 
on her blog. We think that's wonderful. And we really support, um, uh, I suppose you'd call it a concept called open access, yeah. which is about fundamentally making sure that when, when you as a taxpayer have made a contribution to science. So public money funds our universities, it funds special science projects. You know, what, once that public money has gone into that system, then we should all be able to read that without having to pay thousands of euros to, to access the journals where that is often published, for example. I think it's a little bit, um, if I'm really honest, a little bit that people feel um, disconnected from institutions today. So you have these institutions like the EU or an international set of governments who are creating an, an agreement. And it's affecting what you use every day on the internet, but you're not quite sure um, how to talk to those institutions. You're not a lawyer, so you don't know the details. And then in a lot of countries as well, um, it's not that the process was secret, but it's just a really boring agreement in lots of times. So, you know, not all of the governments attended all of the negotiation sessions. Um, there wasn't a lot of media interest beforehand. But, you know, these processes were going on for three years. And in the European Parliament, there were three separate debates in 2009 and 2010. And so we were talking about all the sorts of issues that are being talked about today with ACTA, but people just weren't paying attention. And there, you know, because the internet is growing so quickly in terms of the number of users, its economic impact, you know, the number of people who used the internet in 2007 when this idea first was created compared to today, you know, it's hundreds of millions, if not billions, different. And so all of those people who have just started to get involved in this world, they weren't thinking about, you know, does actor affect my life when it was first created? So for me, it's the, the overall strategic trend, it's not a surprise. You know, I think we see more and more of this sort of issue. And for example, if governments fail to invest in making sure there's fast broadband for people, you know, if their mobile broadband starts dropping out on their phones and, you know, the, the Wi-Fi cuts out at home all of the time because there wasn't enough investment, you know, we're going to see protests and complaints about that sort of thing as well. So I was a bit surprised that it happened at exactly the time that it did and with the pace that it did. But overall, it's not, not surprising because, you know, I think a lot of people are just waking up to the fact that the internet is a really political issue.